Okay, so I think that we can get going. Um, so hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's SEDS online webinar. My name is Chelsea Peterson. And before we get started, I want to thank our sponsorship from the IES, which allows us to offer all of the resources free of charge. That includes all of the recorded lectures, which um, and leans will be up in just a few days. So keep a lookout for that. Well, the learning tools, virtual field trips. So make sure and check out our website and see how you can utilize all that information. Uh, today's lecture is by Dr. Annaline Faubert, who's a professor in the Department of Geosciences at the University of Freiburg. Annaline received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Ghent University in Belgium. She then um, worked for Total before heading on to various uh, scientist and professorship positions in uh, Louvre in Belgium, Guillaumar and Kiel, Illinois, back to Louvre, and then finally landed at the University of Freiburg. So she's had tons of experience in uh, the scientific and academic world. Um, and yeah, it brings a lot of um, interesting research to the game. So she's extremely active in the carbonate sedimentology community and her research focuses on geobiology and carbonate diagenesis. Today, she's going to talk to us about carbonates and evaporites in an active rift setting. So Annaline, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you and I will give you the mic. So thanks a lot, Chelsea, for this very nice introduction. Also, thanks for the invitation to give a talk on Sets Online. And today I'd like to take you all to the AFAR, showing how carbonates and evaporites in an initial and active rift basin may unveil something about the birth of a future ocean. Um, initial rift basins are, as we know, characterized by very heterogeneous sedimentation, heterogeneous sedimentation patterns varying at very short spatial and temporal scales. Eh? Different sedimentary models exist basically, eh? but they only form little puzzle pieces in this complex jigsaw. Eh? The interaction actually between tectonics, eh? surface processes, volcanic events, climate variations and eustasy on sediment flux eh? Sediment deposition and basin dynamics explain the complex stratigraphic architecture in these kind of rift settings. Moreover, you have the complex interaction between surface fluids, brines, hydrothermal processes, and volcanics res resulting in complex diagenetic processes, uh, starting already very early within the depositional environment. Uh. And finally, Complex diagenesis and sedimentary phases result in a very heterogeneous spore network distribution, hindering the too rough understanding of petrophysical properties in those kind of settings. However, they're excellent field analogs. And since the early days of the continental drift theory, the AFA triangle, which you see here, developed into a kind of ideal field lab where the onset of continental and future oceanic rifting can be studied in detail. Um, although we know this is one of the most active rift regions on Earth, eh? And although we know it's a very young incipient rift basin at the transition between continental rifting and oceanization, the Pleistocene and Holocene sedimentary patterns in the Danakil depression has been only recently mapped in detail. And that's what I would like to present here. So this presentation discusses the unique sedimentary record in the Afar and more important even in the Danakil depression. So I take you towards the northern part of the Afar eh? and especially how it contributes eh? to the understanding of the intermittent opening and closure of an incipient rift basin driven by all these external factors. So aesthetic sea level fluctuations, multi-episodic differential uplifting linked to the rift processes and volcano tectonic processes. But most important, how this sheds light also in the understanding of complex sedimentation patterns in such a rift basin. So let's fly together to Eastern Africa and more specifically to this Afar Triangle. Um, in the Afar, rifting started since more or less Oligocene, Miocene times. Classically in this zone, three rift zones meet. Eh? So you have the Red Sea rift, eh? the main Ethiopian rift and the Gulf of Aden rift. Eh? 
As already levered a little bit, the Dalakil Depression is the northern portion of the Afar Triangle, bordered to the west uh, by the Nubian Plateau, uh, and to the east by this little continental sliver, the Dalakil Horst or the Dalakil Block. Uh. The depression features one of the lowest elevations on Earth and is part of this active rift zone associated to the breakup of the Afro-Arabian Plateau. Eh? So you have the Nubian Plate, the Somalian Plate in the south, eh? and the Arabian Plate basically in the east. Eh? What is very special, it is that the crust eh, is still continental crust. It's not yet classical oceanic crust, eh? but the crust is very, very thin. Eh? And it's especially thin in this northern part of the Afar in the Danakil Depression. If you just zoom into this area, it looks like on satellite images, as you see here. So this figure shows a zoom of the Danakil Depression with the Ethiopian highlands, highlands actually in the west eh? and the Danakil Alps in the east. Eh? The central southern part of the depression hosts this famous Erta Ali volcanic range. It's composed of a series of shield volcanoes which are younger than one million years. The basin floor of the Danakil depression features elevations uh, as low as 50 to 120 meters below sea level. So you're working there below sea level. And in terms of daily temperatures, to give you an idea, the Danakil is one of the hottest places on Earth with year-round daily temperatures above 34 degrees. Eh? Um, it looks like, so the central part of the Danakil depression is an highlight floored, eh? elongated salt pen, eh? covering the deepest part of the Danakil Depression over an area of 40 kilometer in length and 10 kilometer width. Eh? Um, and here you see an image of this highlight floored salt, salt pen. Eh? The sedimentary facies at the surface eh, and especially at the margins of the basin uh, are characterized by alluvial fans eh, passing into this very large sand flats eh, with locally also some aeolian dunes. Eh, and this is going then over into this mud flats with locally springs, eh, the saline mud flats and also some shallow brine pens, eh, which are ephemeral. Eh, so they're only there temporary. Eh. Um, Dalol itself forms actually a field, and this is what you see here, of hydrothermal potassium-rich brine springs eh, and fumarolic deposits eh, um, linked to a protovolcano and pos possibly a shallow magmatic segment from one of the magma chambers, big magma chambers sitting there in the deep subsurface. Eh. So Dalol brines have been recently the focus of several studies to understand the limits of life especially in very poly extreme conditions as we have there and as potential analog eh, for the study of the limits of extraterrestrial life on, for example, Mars. Eh. The biogeochemical conditions of the recent Dalol salt brines vary across different pools eh, with pHs ranges from minus 2, minus 1.4 till 6.5. Eh. Also very high salinities and temperatures varying between 30 and 180 degrees. Eh. Uh, until now, only in some of the brine pools, microbial communities, eh, mostly archaea, including taxa prevo which we didn't know eh, to be holophilic sitting there. Only a few of them have been identified. Eh? Uh, in other pools, no life has been detected. Eh? So taxa were dominated mainly by halobacteria and nano halo archaeota. Um, so we can say the basin has not only been useful or has not only been an optimal feed lab to study rift process, but it's also rift processes, but it's also a very nice feed lab to study the tight interaction between sedimentation, geomicrobiological processes, Red Sea level fluctuations, external climatic um, changes, basically, and the deep volcanotectonic processes. Eh? So all these interactions there come together. Research during the last decade was mainly focused, and when you dig into the literature, you will most find most publications focusing on tectonics, volcanology, geophysics. Eh? And this, of course, eh, logic to understand these underlying rift mechanisms in the Afar. Eh? And only a few studies dating back nearly half a century ago 
focused on this unique sedimentary deposits of the northern Afar. And these first studies have been actually industrially initiated within the light of the early potash exploration. And riding on the wave of this early potash exploration, coordinated studies by scientific teams of France, Italy and Germany resulted then in the first structural and stratigraphic mapping of the area. Then it's only in 2013 eh, that people came back eh, and we did this within the framework of a European Science Foundation research network program where we went there and did the first reconnaissance survey eh, on the margins of the Danakil depression, exploring also the variety of the carbonate sedimentary record there. Eh? And there we recognized that none of those deposits had been mapped in detail. That's why we have been writing this Serena project. Eh? So Serena sedimentary record of the Northern Afar, which has been then been funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation and uh, where we were looking mainly at this unique middle to late Pleistocene and Holocene sedimentary archive. Eh? Just in a nutshell how it looks like. Eh? So in the Northern Afar, three rift series are discordantly overlain by Cenozoic seen rift sediments. Eh? intertwined uh, with volcanic material going from basalt to alkaline rhyolites. Uh, and here you see those magmatic rocks. Uh, here you see basically the stratigraphy of the Neogene till the Holocene. Uh. The marginal deposits, so we're splitting this into marginal deposits and the central part of the Danakil depression because the sedimentation patterns are completely different. Eh? The marginal deposits currently outcropping in the Danakil depression are mainly characterized by first the Danakil formation eh? with mainly lacustrine and fluviatil deposits. Eh? This is our new map and you see those Danakil or this Danakil formation is indicated here in this kind of um, slight orange color, yellowish orange color. On top of that, you have the Pleistocene Zariga formation indicated by this deep orange and yellowish colors here. And then on top of that, you have mainly continental lacustrine deposits belonging to the Aftera formation, which is then this beige color, which you see here. In the center of the basin, of course, nowadays, what you have there is this uh, highlight pen, the saline pen, basically. However, when you drill into the deepest subsurface uh, in the center of the basin, thick evaporite successions are occurring. Uh, and in total, um, we know that more than 1,000 meter thickness uh, of these evaporites is occurring there. Um, the potash beds are currently mined. However, what's deeper there is for the moment not known. And also one of the quest big question marks is uh, how those central part um, sediments in the subsurface, in the central part of the graben, are linked uh, with the deposits at the margin of the graben. And how the Zariga formation is interfingering with uh, more silicyclastic input coming from the plateau. Uh, and the evaporites in the central part of the basin. These are big questions we still have, basically. Yeah? But you see nicely this package of seen rift sediments on top of the pre-rift sediments. Yeah? Let's walk a bit through this. So the Danakil formation, the Zariga formation, and the Afdera formation. So the Danakil formation, these are some profiles across the margin of the basin. It's mainly composed of this fluvial to lacustrine siliciclastic sediments. These are thick packages here. Here you see the same thick packages plastered on those pre-rift pre sediments. Eh? Um, and they're typically locally also called the red beds series. Eh? So mainly siliciclastic material. On top of that, and this is the major focus of this study, you see this middle to late Pleistocene sedimentary record of the Zariga formation. And the Zariga formation bears clear witnesses of the past connection of the Danakil basin with the Red Sea. Yeah? We have been detangling that and multiple episodes of marine flooding 
and desiccation led to the deposition of successions of open marine coral reefs, calc aronites, coastal oolites, and hypersaline micropylites topped by gypsum deposits surrounding the margins of the Danakil depression. And you can follow those deposits across the whole margin. What you see here is what we would call the Pleistocene Danakil Thea. So it's a zero meter sea level of nowadays, eh? but it's also outlining the surface of the Pleistocene Danakil Sea. Eh? So let's have a look at some outcrops at the western margin of the Danakil Depression, indicated on the map here with red dots. Eh? We first have a look, I will detangle this western margin in two parts. We first have a look at the more southernmost carbonate outcrops eh, at the margin, and then we will have a look to the more um, northernmost carbonate outcrops. Eh. The panorama picture shows you how it looks like. So you have a Pleistocene fringing reef unit directly attached to the volcanic substrate. Eh. This is laterally going over into some thicker packages of oidal and bioclastic grainstones. Eh? And on top of that, you have gypsum deposits, eh? so forming part of the evaporites. Eh? On the lowermost picture, you now notice actually how those coral reefs eh, are directly colonizing, in this case, the volcanic substrate, the basalts in this case. Eh? On this um, profile, you see a kind of schematic stratigraphy of those southernmost outcrops of the Pleistocene marine coral terraces, eh, evidencing, in this case, two successions. And this pattern is visible across different outcrops. Eh? So for the sake of ease, we were dividing this uh, succession in the lowermost succession A and the uppermost succession B. Eh? with the lowermost succession representing very well-developed coralgeal fringing reefs, uh, again, going over into this oolitic uh, and uh, bioclastic grainstones. Uh, um, towards the top of the reef, red algae frameworks start to dominate. And then these green dots here, these are then aragonitic crusts, uh, sometimes going over into more microbiolitic fabrics. I will show you that immediately. Uh, and then ultimately you have some gypsum deposits, which of course are eroded during a lot later phase. Eh? Then you have this huge erosional unconformity. And on top of that, you have again corals appearing, but this time the corals are not forming anymore a well-developed coral gel reef. Eh? At that moment, the corals are occurring as little patch reefs. Eh? Again, with laterally some bioclastic oil and by grainstones, uh, and then again, aragonite crusts on top of it, indicated here in blue, uh, um, and also laterally co-occurring with spherulites. And so you have crusts uh, and spherulites occurring in the same similar stratigraphic layer, the one only occurring directly above the grainstones, while the crusts uh, are directly attached on the coral frameworks. Uh. Within the cavities of the reefs, indicated here by those um, patches, eh, you have also microbiolites growing, being a little bit different in fabric than the crusts on top of the reef. I will show you this immediately. Eh? This is how probably the situation looked like during the Pleistocene, eh? um, and certainly when I talk about this fringing reef deposits. So well-developed fringing reef belts eh, dominated by corals in the first place, eh? and Christos coralline algae, which increase towards the top. Eh? The reefal framestone pages is dominated by Porites, Colastrea, Diploasteae assemblages, eh? but also a lot of Merulinidae, eh? especially at the reef crests and reef flats. Eh? A thick red algal framestone, as I said already, covers the uppermost part of the reef, eh? uh, built by branching and laminar Lithophyllum cotianum, eh? with minor contributions of Lithophyllum prototitum. Eh? Um, so this is a very strongly lithified uppermost unit, eh? and it's present at almost all studied coral reef outcrops. And for us, it is a very important correlative marker horizon, this algal framework at the top of the lowermost reef unit. As I said already, 
on top of this fringing reef, you only have sporadically some patch reefs, uh, which belong then to a younger reef terrace, eh? but not anymore this very well-developed reef unit as we have seen for this lower succession. When you go a bit towards the top of the reef, you have this algal reef framework coming in, but then on top of this, you have this huge aerogenetic crusts eh? and microbial buildup stopping the coral reefs and associated also partly to these algae frameworks. Eh? However, they have different macromorphologies. Sometimes you see real crusts, eh? as you see here. Sometimes they occur as this columnar buildups, eh? as you see quite nicely here. However, in all cases, they show a very nice laminated fabric, which are in this case, very isopachus laminated fabrics. When you zoom into these laminated fabrics, we see that argonite fibers are the main building blocks of the fibrous fabrics. And these white arrows on these stem pictures, you see the same actually on the thin section pictures, but the white arrows on those stem pictures points to a kind of growth interruption surface within these argonite fans. However, those growth interruption surfaces are covered by drapes of magnesium silicate and are very rich in organic matter. The laminated fabrics can change from very regular, as we call it, isopachus lamination into more irregular isopachus laminations. And this can happen in one sample eh, or within one layer. In this case, the fans are not preferentially growing perpendicular anymore to the laminations as do argonite fibers involved, involved in isopachus, isopachus lamination. The elemental maps here show the distribution of calcium, silica, and magnesium. You have very nicely here these argonite fans indicated by the calcium. So these kind of layers. And on top of that, you have this layers enriched, uh, or in between them, sorry, you have these layers enriched in magnesium silicates and organic matter, indicated here in green by the silica, in red we have highlighted the magnesium. Also spherulites are interfingering with the crusts uh, in the same stratigraphic layer again, uh, together with specific bivalve assemblages dominated by this, for example, brachytontis, uh, which you see here, and uh, even also potamidid uh, gastropods, which you see here in this, with this yellow arrow. Eh? So this is all occurring in the same stratigraphic layer. When you go again within your coral reef frameworks, you have dark cavity sitting there, and there you have also microbial carbonates growing, as you see here on this field picture. There, the structure looks a bit different, or the fabric, I have to say, looks a bit different. Eh? So there you have a classically thrombolytic fabric, eh? uh, which are occurring, um, within the cavities of these reefs. However, the building bricks of this thrombolytic fabrics are again very similar. It's again aragonite, uh, so those are aragonites basically, and you have again magnesium silicates in between those aragonite fans. Uh. We had a more detailed look towards the magnesium silicates and TEM and SEM measurements evidence that the magnesium silicates are made by, and this you see quite nicely here, individual sepulite fibers. Eh? Um, and often those fibers, eh, so the magnesium silicates in this thin section looks a bit more blackish, but they are often associated also to unidentified permineralized cells, eh, which you see them here sitting. Eh? When zooming into the magnesium silicates, they really look like these fibers. Eh? You see here the morphology of these magnesium silicate filaments, but with a big zoom eh? made up by those sepulite fibers. Eh? Again, some of those filaments are then again um, associated to this chain-like features composed of subspherical bodies. Eh? Um, elemental map shows again nicely how these magnesium silicate filaments are interfiguring, fingering with those aragonite botroids. Eh? So a very high diversity of fabrics. But what do they tell? That's another question. Eh? So what we see is that these isopachus laminated crusts, eh, sometimes they occur as very um, um, continuous crusts, sometimes as these little botrytes, sometimes as these columnar structures. Eh? Um, but they all occur in the stratigraphic same la layer. They probably precipitated without significant microbial influence due to simple supersaturated conditions eh, prevailing after the closure of the connection of the Tarakil depression with the Red Sea. Eh? And 
probably incipient evaporation and CO2 driven weathering of the volcanic seafloor caused a very short lived phase of increased alkalinity, promoting this huge aragonite crust precipitation before extensive evaporite deposition took over. And they occur exactly below those gypsum deposits. Eh? Um, however, as soon as we go to these irregular laminated crusts eh, um, or the spherulites, we see that the amount of silica is increasing. Eh? So the amount, eh, the ratio aragonite versus magnesium silicates is increasing. Eh? Um, the origin of this is questionable, but it could be interpreted as a result of microbial mediated mineralization with the permineralization of the cell walls, which we saw by silica, or simply, and I think this is the more plausible situation, the precipitation of a poorly crystallized magnesium silica phase, which is very, very unstable, eh? because as soon as you shoot on that with the SEM, it's gone nearly on an alveolar extracellular organic matrix due to this rise of the pH. Yeah? Um, also to the rise of the pH, not only yeah, because of this incipient closure of the basin, but also because of active oxygenic photosynthesis. Yeah? So of these um, um, little cells sitting there. Yeah? So the diverse array of fabrics yeah, which we encounter in the Danakil depression shows actually that you have a continuum between something which looks abiotic eh, and something which looks like microbial mediated. Eh? And probably these processes interact also in a continuum in oversaturated bodies producing these hybrid, hybrid microbial abiotic crusts. Eh? But what then? Eh? So you have, you see this very well preserved fabrics, eh? but we see also that often the crusts are characterized by a variety of preservation states, eh? which allowed us to reconstruct different early diagetic steps, altering very fast the primer fabrics eh? and shedding some new light on fabric preservation through space and time. Eh? What we see often is that with time, the aragonite eh, is transformed in something which looks like a pilloidal microite. Eh? And you see different steps in there. So what we see in a third step, because it occurs also often in one sample where we have the very pristine crust next to the crust or part of the crust which is completely diagetically altered. Eh? Uh, but those SEM and tin section pictures eh, combined with Raman spectroscopy shows that exactly at your growth interruption surfaces where you have this unstable magnesium silicate sitting and a lot of organic matter, that there exactly at those surfaces you start to um, precipitate calcite. Eh? So it's actually precipitating exactly in between here. You see it also quite nicely in here. You see it quite nicely also in the Raman spectroscopy. So red is calcite, eh? um, blue is aragonite. Eh? You see actually that with time from those growth interruption surfaces, eh, the calcite is growing further and is eating the aragonite, engulfing the aragonite fibers. Eh? And this you see also quite nicely here. So you see that the calcite starts to engulf the aragonite fibers. Eh? With time, eh, you of course start to dissolve your aragonite and you invert your fabric. Eh? So the aragonite is dissolved and there where you had the magnesium silicates and organic matter, there you have this calcite eh, um, preserved. Eh? or calcite precipitated. Often this calcite there looks very dirty. Eh? So probably eh, the magnesium silicate and the remaining organic matter is driving part also of this adiagenesis and it's taken into as dirty inclusions within the calcite precipitating there, resulting in this kind of dirty pilloidal microite. Eh? So you have the inversion of your fabrics. Eh? So we go from an aragonite crust to something which looks like pilloidal microite through time. Eh? Um, so this is a nice fate of the genesis of your primary aragonite thick crust signal. But let's come back to the main story. So how I project this back into a rift basin. So I was talking about two successions, eh, which represents the transition from high stand conditions with very well developed reef faces during which the Danakil depression was connected with the Red Sea. The Red Sea is not far eh, towards the development of a restricted evaporative basin eh, where you have then the crust microbiotes and ultimately the gypsum deposits uh, um, deposited at the margin of the basins. We have been dating 
the pristine argonite coral skeletons and the three Dagna species, it's still a hassle to come around with the datings eh, because of um, alteration on the one hand, although we have sometimes 100% argonite, it's difficult to get the initial uranium thorium ratios. But those are probably, and this is an unsolved question, the initial seawater conditions in an incipient drift basin due to the high interaction between your seawater and your volcanics is not yet completely understood. Eh? However, we see a clustering between eh, um, datings clustering around marine isotopic stage 5e and datings clustering around marine isotopic stage 7. Eh? Um, another set of datings shows exactly the same here. Datings are plotted against the relative sea level curve. Eh? Um, and what you see is again that datings are clustered around marine isotopic stage 5e. Eh? So the two dated terraces eh? here around 7 eh? um, correspond to the two interglacial when the Red Sea level was the highest. Eh? So also the Red Sea level fluctuations, the aesthetic ones, had a major impact on the flooding of the depression eh? besides the tectonic influence. Eh? However, this is the story basically for the southernmost outcrops. What about this northernmost outcrops? We travel now to the north of the Danakil Depression. We stay at the western margin. And there, the analysis of different outcrops, uh, the, um, the study revealed that we don't have only the presence of two coral reef terraces, but there are more than two coral reef terraces, probably three or even four. We could spot remains of carbonate sediments at higher elevations. Eh? On top of this, we see that the Coralja reef terraces are detangled completely due to the tectonic uplift in the northern part. This was not the case in the southern part. There you have everything in stratigraphic correct order, one reef actually on top of the other reef. Eh? This is not the case in the north. Eh? Um, this results also in the fact, eh? so you have much more tectonic uplift in the north. This results also in the fact that older terraces, eh? here we dated those terraces also, are overlying younger terraces. So in the northern part of the depression, marine isotopic stage 7 corals are lying on top of marine isotopic stage 5e corals. We think that coral reef terraces 3 and 4 are even older, but we never could date them because the corals looks altered. Eh? Um, here you do see then a compilation of all the elevations of N marine isotopic stage 5e reefs and marine isotopic stage 7 reefs in the Danakil depression, superimposed on a steepness index map. Eh? So we are still working here. We're looking at this part. I just zoomed a bit um, out, eh? and this is a zoom in of this part on the western margin. Everything in blue is relatively low elevation, everything in dark red corresponds to a relative higher elevation. And you see a clear difference eh, in elevation between the northern margin eh, and the southern margin, which is explained in this case by active tectonics. Eh? So differential tectonic uplift of your rift shoulders. Again, for the moment, I'm only talking about the basin margin. I'm not yet talking about this central part of the Graben. So uplift of your rift shoulders is superimposing here uh, on your, or is clearly visible due to the elevation of the coral reef terraces. Eh? And this helped us also a lot, lot the detangling of the coral reef terraces, because the combination of dating and eleva elevation did allow then to calculate uplift rates of the margins of the Danakil depression during the middle to late Pleistocene. And the maximum uplift re rates which we calculated reaches more or less 1.43 millimeter per year with most of the values comprised between 0, 0 0.5 and 1 millimeter per year. Um, we also could calculate that the uplift rates are varying significantly through time, being much smaller between marine isotopic stage 5e and no, than between marine isotopic stage 7 and 5e. So most of the change there, most of the tectonic activity took place between 7 and 5e. Those coral uplift patterns, steepness index maps, and uplift rate values can be interpreted then back in terms of basin dynamics. Eh? So um, the significant uplift of the shoulders eh, in the basin indicates this active rifting phase. Eh? And the more important tectonic movements in the northern tip of the depression eh, um, or interpreted as an indication that this area is the current locus of deformation. Eh? In the north, reefs developed on the footwall 
of major active faults eh, that produce very steep scarps. Eh? And here you just see a topographic profile uh, through the northern part of the margin. So very fault, uh, steep fault scarp zones. Eh? Uh, while in the south, eh, so here you see some topographic profiles from the southern reefs eh, or where the southern reefs are set from the southern margin, I have to tell. Eh? So blue boxes eh, and the green box. Eh? Um, Reefs are colonizing mainly large alluvial fans, uh, but in the hanging wall of older, less active basin bounding faults where erosion and sedimentation uh, smoothed already the topography and produced already a very smooth topography. So this is also changing um, at kilometer scale. So at 50 kilometers, you're changing from something very steep to something which has a smoothed topography. Yeah? Um, we have been um, thinking what could be the cause of this. Eh? And probably the uplift of the northern margin is linked. I was talking about this continental sliver here. We think it's a small little microplate. It acts as a microplate where you see the rotation of this Damakil block putting a lot of stress on the northern tip of the Damakil block uh, depression. Eh? So, and this is probably causing the most of the uplift in the north. Eh? So this is how the sedimentological model, or what's the sedimentological model we propose for the evolution of the basin margins. Eh? So at least for the part where we're sure of, not for the older coral reef terraces. So during late marine isotopic stage eight, probably the basin was a continental basin. So with not any flooding, eh? classical continental conditions with alluvial fence, which developed at the base of your plateau. Eh? During marine isotopic stage seven, the basin got flooded eh? with the development of very nice fringing coral reef terraces. Eh? After marine isotopic stage seven, sea level drop again, or red sea level drop again, and probably also uplift of the rift shoulders. So you deconnect your Danakil basin from the Red Sea, eh? resulting in evaporation of your basin, resulting in the deposition of those gypsum deposits at the margin again of the basin. Eh? Um, you get there a drawdown facies. Eh? During late marine isotopic stage six, you have again continental conditions prevailing with probably conditions which were very similar as we see nowadays in the depression with uh, alluvial cones, sand flats, mud flats, and then probably going in the central part of the basin over into a highlight um, um, based um, saline pen. Eh? Then during marine isotopic stage five, you open up the basin again. However, conditions were not that optimal anymore in the basin and only patch reefs were developing. At the same time, you keep on uplifting your margins uh, in the northern part of the basin, detangling the different coral reef terraces, having also older coral reef terraces on top of the younger. Of course, they have been partly eroded during this phase uh, of late marine isotopic stage six. Uh. Then you close off again the basin, sea level drop, as for 5e, uh, at the same time you keep on uplifting your margins and we think this is the final desiccation event of the Danakil depression. After that the Red Sea was not anymore into the depression or we don't have any indications that the Red Sea was entering the depression ever after marine isotopic stage 5e and you enter into the present day uh, sedimentary environmental conditions as we see uh, nowadays and which we showed or which I showed you at the start of the presentation. Okay this is all for the basin margins. Huh? But what happens in the central part of the basin? What about the central part of the Danakil depression? Let's have a look uh, at the seismic line. So we have been looking at industrial seismic sections and industrial wells. Uh. So let's look at one of those seismic lines running from the margin towards the central part of the depression. The sedimentary records in the central part of the basin are represented by thick evaporite successions composed of highlight intercalated with gypsum, anhydrite and potash bearing deposits. Eh? So this is which I will show you on the next slide, how such a well looks like. Eh? What is also very visible, we were only looking at the margin here. So only very thin deposits. They were only like 10 meters max. Eh? So seven meters, 10 meters. Eh? So not very thick. And suddenly, when you follow a same seismostratigraphic unit, you talk about more than 400 meters of sediments, uh, which are deposited uh, in a very similar time period. Uh. Um, so um, this is basically what we saw now also based on the well data. However, to date, not 
any subsalt eh, or sub sedimentary records are available from this part. We only have calibration for the uppermost part of the sedimentary succession. Eh? So uh, it would be very nice to know also what's below here. Probably it's not only this um, first eh, 600 meters eh, um, evaporitic successions we have, but we probably have much more evaporites below there. Eh? Uh, we have been describing some of those core sections, and I just present you one of the reference core wells. Eh? So um, this is just one of the reference core wells in the central part of the Danakil Depression. So we have a well of 625 meters, more or less. Eh? The lowermost part of the core sections represent basically what we call a marginal marine environment, eh? characterized by marine microfauna, but also a quite high bromine content. We have been measuring the bromine content in the highlights. Eh? Also, you have the intercalation of siliciclastic units, eh? sandy units, which probably reflect the impact Input of fluviatile deposits during this phase, suggesting rather a wet climate. So this is corresponding to the final stage of marine isotopic stage 5e. We could correlate this horizon with the marginal outcrops. Uh, the uppermost part of this lowermost interval is characterized by the presence of magnesite, eh? high TOC levels, and the presence of type 1, eh? so saprophallic carogen. Eh? So probably you have already the indication to close off gently your basin, eh? but you create a basin with strong water stratification, having anoxic conditions at the bottom and witnessing of that of basin restriction. Eh? This interval transitions then very nicely, basically, into evaporites eh? and finally, ultimately, the presence of potash salts, eh? indicating the stepwise gradual closure of the basin with very high bromine contents eh? uh, and also the deposition of complex evaporites such as sylvite, kaunite, bischofite, carnalite, eh? and very nicely a change in halide facies. Eh? So you go to very clear transparent halide. Eh? Above this potash interval, a thick package of highlight is still uh, present, but with lower bromine content, eh? confirming an important paleoenvironmental change. Eh? And probably we go towards more continental conditions eh? um, with um, laminated bottom growth highlight facies pointing, pointing probably towards the presence of a hypersaline lake. Eh? The thickness of the unit we can explain by remobilization of older marine evaporites, eh, which are exposed also partly at the margins. Then you have a nicely alternation of fine grained sediments and highlights, eh, reflecting the transition to a saline pen environment comparable to the present day conditions at the Danakil Depression. Climate was dry. Salt may again come also from recycling of older evaporites, but also of filling of the saline pan sporadically with water. And then finally, the interval between 150 and 70 meters, there you have an increase in fine-grained sediments uh, with only minor layers of highlight. Uh. Probably you have again a more humid period here with the installation of a lake in the depression. Uh. Um, we have been dating part of the microfauna in there, and this corresponds to the African humid period. Eh? And finally, you have your last unit on top of that, eh? which represents the salt pine and ephemeral lake conditions, which we have nowadays in the basin. Eh? So you see very nicely the gradual closure of your basin. You go from an basically marine Red Sea influenced basin, close off completely towards still this succession stack of evaporites, but into a continental basin or um, sedimentary environment again. Eh? So what you see, this is the combination. So you have your uppermost um, part of our seismostratigraphic section, basically. So this is only the upper 600 meter. Again, remember, the whole basin is filled with 2.5 kilometer of sediments, possibly. But we only have calibration on that. Eh? So you have 625 meters of evaporized deposited since marine isotopic stage 5e, so in less than 125,000 years. Eh? So it's possible to produce large amount of evaporized in a very short time scale, eh? uh, with as main mechanism, first of all, seawater evaporation and then recycling by continental waters. Eh? Maybe or probably we have even older marine excursions down here. This is or could be correlated eh, with 
the marginal deposits uh, where your sedimentary thickness is very much reduced. Uh. However, the sedimentary fabric is also completely different. Uh. Um, with that, we could say that the Damakil evaporites are probably a very nice modern analog for understanding salt giants in the past. Uh. Um, so what's happening in the saline pen nowadays? I only talked for the moment on the Damakil formation, the Zariga formation, the evaporites uh, in the central part of the basin. What about this very young uh, of their formation? What about the saline pen nowadays? Uh? So I have been showing you already the highlight floor pen, uh, this ephemeral lakes, that's how it looks like, but I would like to take you a bit more south. Uh? So also it's still part of the Danakil depression and this is Lake Avdera. It's a hypersaline lake and it's an active hypersaline lake and one of the big questions we had there, why this lake is not ephemeral, uh? why this lake is all the time there where all the other lakes are just very shallow uh, little um, um, lakes which are not persistent throughout the year. So we went there with a small zodiac boat, did some multi-meme mapping, yeah? trying to understand why this lake is not yet dried out in this saline pen nowadays, and to understand whether this lake could be a remnant from the Pleistocene Danakil Red Sea or not. Eh? Um, so we have been looking at this multi-bay metabory, and we could see that Lake Avdera is more than 70 meters deep, so lying at 195 meters below sea level, if you take also the surface elevation. Um, with that, it's the deepest part of the Danakil Depression. Eh? Um, the reason why it's so deep there, eh? is probably the fact that it's part of an incipient transform fault zone uh, where we see uh, that two volcanic ranges are connected with each other. You see here the Tatali volcanic range and the Erta Ali volcanic range. Yeah? Why the lake is not dried out? It's fed actually nowadays by hot springs, draining the water from the Ethiopian plateau into the deepest part of the depression through a system of subsurface fault networks. Eh? And the yellow stars represent some of the springs we studied. Eh? Uh, the water is researching at the lake margin at temperatures between 40 and 50 degrees. Eh? Um, cyanobacteria are living in these waters, but we did substrate experiments. They're not precipitating nowadays, but they were precipitating in the very recent past, eh? forming this very nice travertine fabrics. Uh, um, so you have the lacustrine sediments basically cemented, uh, uh, and then you have this travertine fabrics with some stromatolithic structures in there. So this is the fabrics uh, of carbonates uh, you see at the lake margins. Uh. However, within the lake, you don't precipitate any carbonate. The lake is hypersaline, and what you precipitate in there nowadays is gypsum. Uh. So you have the formation of what we call gypsum reefs. They're fringing basically the islands, for example, there's a little island here, and you have gypsum reefs around, uh, um, which huge cauliflower gypsum hats. Uh. Even within the lake, uh, the plants which are growing there are completely gypsified, uh, as you see here, around the roots uh, of those plants. Uh. And when you then take sediments in the central part of the lake, some core sections, uh, you see very nice laminated forests, uh, so annual fluctua seasonal fluctuations uh, with alternating gypsum algae and pseudocyclastic layers. Eh? So this is probably seasonal driven. Eh? So another little piece of the puzzle in our rift basin. So what do we have at the margin? Coral reefs. Eh? Two youngest coral reef terraces have been dated at 5e and 7. With that, elevations and datings, we could calculate uplift and subsidence rates. Eh? They're topped by transitional microbiolites and crusts, eh? uh, which witness eh, from an incipient evaporation stage and CO2-driven weathering. Uh, you have a full continuum between microbial-mediated and abiotic fabrics. Uh, they're also digenetically altered in a lot of cases. Uh. You have marginal, these are still marginal deposits. On top of that, you have gypsum, but in the basin center, you have huge evaporite successions in the central part, uh, which witness the final desiccation of the Danakil depression since marine isotopic stage 5e. Uh, and the recent saline pen, uh, there are still some hypersaline lakes in this active rift setting um, settled, uh, which are fed by meteoric water from the Ethiopian plateau with thermal springs and spring carbonates around the lake margin and gypsum precipitation within the lake. Uh. So with that, I wanted to show you that the Danakil depression is a very nice holistic field analog for understanding rift sediments. Uh. You see a very diverse sedimentary facies um, having a very short spatial and temporal variability 
in this active rift basin, diversity in sedimentary facies patterns. Uh, that it could be an excellent field analog for understanding everything which is called an in industry often the pre-salt. Huh? But it's also a modern salt giant. With that, it's an excellent field analog to understand the Messinian salinity crisis, for example. And you see everything from good preservation to very uh, diagenetic fabric. So you can study the fate of diagenesis. So it's an excellent field analog to understand diagenetic facies. Huh? And with all these different pieces of the puzzle, we can construct then a sedimentary model of this active rift basin. However, some pieces of the puzzle are still missing. Yeah? Uh, we still have questions. And to date, as I said already, not any sub salt sedimentary core record below those depths which we sampled. So below those 600 to 700 meter depth are available from the central part of the bas basin. And we think we have even more than 2.5 kilometers of sedimentary infill. And for that, we are currently writing on a proposal, an ICDP proposal, after the whole drilling onset of sedimentary processes in an active rift basin. If you would like to follow that, here is the website where you can follow all the work uh, related to the drilling proposal, workshops, and so on. Eh? Um, we are also trying to publish for the moment a lot of the material of the material a lot is in prep sorry for that eh? it's it's nearly out a lot of the papers are nearly written so keep an eye out there we also made a new map of the whole AFA triangle eh? based on um, several field expeditions but also satellite data combined with um, historical reports and so on eh? so uh, this is also coming out soon so keep an eye out on that eh? and finally um, I would like to thank the full Serena team geoscience is always teamwork eh? and I would keep on saying that eh? teamwork which is diverse inclusive and equal eh? so um, and with that I would like to spend mention also the bilateral exchange program we have between Switzerland and Ethiopia where we have an active exchange of students at different levels eh? thanks a lot eh? and sorry for having gone over the time Super, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Annaline. I uh, surely appreciated it and lots of interesting stuff in the AFAR. So I can't uh, wait to see all the papers that you guys are going to produce. <laughs> so um, if you guys didn't catch it, the chat is now open. So if you have any questions for Annaline, please type them in there and we will get to them um, right away. Uh, since there's nothing in there yet, I can start with my questions, which is always nice. Uh, so Annalene, I have a question between the reefs that developed during um, MIS 7 versus 5E. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. of course, one of the major differences that you mentioned is um, really sort of like the patchiness compared to the very nicely developed um, reefs that you get um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in MIS 7. So I'm wondering if you have an idea of what the main driver is for that change. Is it sort of like water chemistry? Is it because of that partial closure, um, mm -hmm. energy conditions? Do you have any, any thoughts there? Yeah. yeah, I think it's really also the water chemistry and also the influx. And so five is a very humid period also. Eh? At that moment, you have also a lot of influx from the uh, Ethiopian plateau coming into your Danakil depression, eh? mm -hmm. which uh, might create also a kind of turbid water. Sometimes this can be positive for corals, but sometimes also negative. And there is a question, do they just miss then the window of opportunity of growth? Eh? Um, I think it's a combination of both, basically. I also think, eh, the, as we call it, the gateway, so the connection between the Danakil depression and the Red Sea, or we would say the Danakil Sea and the Red Sea, basically clear was not that um, um, deep anymore so it was only a very shallow gateway and certainly during five because the rift shoulders are getting more and more uplifted basically yeah? um, and um, with that uh, I think also the basin was a bit more restrained uh, restricted uh? so um, yeah I think it's a combination of both uh? yeah okay that makes sense um, I guess you know mm -hmm. Typically, lots of uh, lots of times, it's it, it comes down to that a combination of different factors that that all play a part. So that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, another question I was wondering: Is there sort of a, a comparable modern setting where you could look into the transition from um, the aragonite, the magnesium silicate, and then the the calcite? I did, I was really interested in sort of those dip, those layers that you got in between the corals and how um how that process might look in terms of the transition from that to 
than the more stable calcite. Uh, you mean uh, in a recent setting, you mean? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess you probably I, wouldn't have the calcite yet, but you would still, um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you, you would assume that you would still have that magnesium silicate layering within yeah. the I think there are a lot of, um, there are a few papers out there, like from other uh, scientist groups, basically, which also look then at um, um, secondary calcite precipitation, basically, even within crusts and microbiolites. So this is happening. Yeah? So this is, uh, but how this is linked to the magnesium silicates and what's the role yeah, of the magnesium mainly, silicates? Not, not necessarily, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 not yeah. necessarily the transition from the aragonite to the calcite, of course, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but just that connection to the magnesium silicate. Yeah, this is a very, very good question. And my major question is even, and I can't solve this yet, where is the magnesium silica then going? Yeah? So where are yeah. the magnesium silicates going in the end? Yeah? So um, they're unstable, I know, uh, but what's happening with that? Uh? Magnesium, I could understand more or less, uh, but the silica, what's happening with all the silica in the end? Uh? So this is still, is it driven out uh, within the uh, borders uh, at some point? Uh? So um, this is one question I, I, it's it's perturbing me in this setting, basically. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, and there are a lot of studies or some of them, a lot of people are saying, okay, yeah, you can also just precipitate magnesium silicate. There are a lot of discussions about that. Huh? So you don't need necessary microbes for that. This is one part of the discussion, but how you get the transformation, this is a- um, Yeah, that's a yeah. big question there. So, Indeed. Okay. Huh? Mm -hmm. So maybe a little, <clears throat> a different type of way to look at that, that question or a different environment. If anybody has any suggestions, then <laughs> let us know. Mm -hmm. Definitely really interesting. Okay, if anybody has any questions from the audience, get those in now. Um, if not, then thank you, Annaline, so much again for coming to SEDS Online. We really appreciate it. It's exciting work. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing all of the outcome of that. And everybody out there, um, I'm sure hopefully you've, most of you have noticed but we've shifted a little bit on SEDS Online to um, one webinar on the second Wednesday of every month. So we're, we're shifting to one per month. So make sure and come back on December 14th for a talk by Anne Bernhardt. And um, she's gonna let us know a little bit more about submarine canyons. And yeah, thank you again, Annaline, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>